the promises of the Lord because of what the Lord has said uh, about the assembly. This, uh, the assembling of ourselves together is not uh, merely a, a, a formality or a, a tradition. There are promises connected with the uh, assembly of the saints. He's, Jesus promised to be here. Amen. And he said, where two or three are gathered, there am I in the midst of them. Uh, you have to have faith to know it. You have to have faith to perceive uh, his presence. But when, when we come to the assembly, this is what we expect. We expect that he, his presence is, is with us. Amen. And if his presence is, is here, then he's going to be, he's going to do something. Amen. Jesus is not just a bystander. He's not, he doesn't just come to observe. It was the church at Laodicea. He was outside knocking on the door, but that was the exception. Jesus is not observing his church from afar. He's the, he's the great shepherd. He's the, he's bringing many sons to glory. He's in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, which are the, which are the churches. And so we, we come to the assembly with it, with an expectation of something being given of something of some work being, being accomplished. Jesus just, it's just not the divine nature to just, to just stand and, and watch. That, that actually would be more like a judgment. Yes. If, if, the, if the Lord just observed and did nothing, that would be, that'd be closer to a judgment than it would fellowship. But, that, but the, the, the Lord, we've come to have fellowship with, with the Father and with the Son, and the Holy Spirit teaches and, and leads and guides. So I hope as you as you come to the assembly that you're you're looking for something, you know, you're you're expecting to receive something. Um, so when you when you come, you're uh, you, you you leave better equipped. You leave with brighter eyes. You leave with stronger hope. You you leave with a with you know more rooted and, and grounded in the in the faith. So that's what we're that's what we're. Uh, expecting tonight in fact the lord said in the psalms there the lord commanded the blessing yeah. now that <clears throat> there's a there's a there's a uh, an intention there a commanded blessing it's not just a like he rain he causes it to rain on the just and on the unjust but that that that's not a commanded blessing a commanded blessing is where is where his his people are and he where he takes uh takes note this this word of the apostle paul i want to Hopefully, uh, dig some things out of this text that uh, for you that have that has blessed me, and how the apostle Paul ad addressed the church. He had had such a desire for the church. Now his his desire for the church was not only for the church, and it wasn't his interest for the church. Paul's desires and ministry towards the church actually came from God, and so we're seeing the Lord's heart for the church through Paul. And so th that's what we want to read here um, in the text and be able to, to observe the divine nature through Paul. You know, I've heard people say things like, that was just Paul's opinion, or that was, that was their culture, or things like that, as if, uh, as if to, to take something out of the scriptures that are intended you know, for, for us to, to have, for us to, to lay hold of. Paul did not perpetrate his opinion. He was sent. He was sent from God. Amen. There was there was one time where Paul said, "I don't have a word of God on this, so I'll, I'll give you I'll give you my word, my mind on it." He, but then he he said, "But in this, I think I have the Spirit." Well, I'm inclined to to receive if that could be an opinion, and I, I wouldn't call it an opinion, but I I still receive it as from the Lord because Paul was inspired from God. He was sent by God with this uh, with this message Amen. so this word let let us who are of the day this is a word of appeal you notice how he's distinguishing between people he doesn't say let all of us who are human he says let us who are of the day let us who are of the day be sober putting on the blessed breastplate of Faith and love and fern helmet, the hope of salvation. Paul, Paul's putting out an appeal there that, that tends to draw some people. The other people, it passes them right over. Let us who are of the day. What does that mean to somebody who's in the darkness, who, who has no thought of God? Like the scripture says, God is not in all of his thoughts. What does the, how does this word light upon that kind of person? 
if it does light on them, it doesn't stay very long. Let us who are of the day. Think about how that, how that affects you. How do you receive that? Let us who are of the day. He's appealing to the people of light. I find this is an appealing word. Let us who are of the day. There's certain, uh, certain people find Paul's words appealing. Other, other people find Paul's words not appealing. <laughs> or a lot of other things as, as well. Some people find them foolish. Some people wrote off what Jesus said as foolish. Remember the, the ruler, one of the rulers in the book of Acts told Paul that he was mad. He said, your, your great learning's driven you mad. Well, I've never, I've never thought of Paul as a madman. His words, I find them appealing. They, they draw me. Maybe you've been in a, um, in a crowd where there's all kinds of noises and, and all kinds of things being said, all kinds of things being talked about, and everything is just kind of reduced to noise until you hear somebody use some word of the Lord, like amen or hallelujah or praise God or, or uh, brother or sister. And you notice how that word just kind of, it just kind of rises above all, all the rest of it. It's, it's, that was appealing. That kind of word, that kind of language is appealing. Amen. I've heard people use use words that are actually inspired words that they didn't know, didn't really know what they meant. I've heard the word at least two times in my work experience. I've heard the word edification used where the people they didn't know what the word meant, and I I, I wanted to I wanted to, I didn't but I wanted to say that you know that word doesn't belong to you. That's an inspired word. That's a, that's a godly word. That word belongs to the household of faith, edification. Because you've got to have faith to be, to be edified. But see, that, this kind of word, it, it's, draw, it's appealing to us. That's exactly what Paul's doing in this, in this word. Let us who are of the day. He's drawing people out with this well, word, of the, word of the Lord. Maybe if you've been in a foreign country and, and had, for any extended period of time, only foreign languages spoken around you, where you didn't, you didn't know if they were talking about you, you didn't know if they were talking, you didn't know what they were talking about. And then you, you hear some word from your, your home country, and you start looking around. It's like, well, that sounds good, you know. It, um, it, it, has a, it has a drawing nature to it. It's like, that's, that's from my country, that's a, and that has to be a countryman to me for them to use that that language. This is Paul's using country, heavenly country language. Let us who are of the day. He's striking a chord with those who are walking in the light. He's appealing. He's making making an appeal. Let us who are of the day, like the, the hands of a musician on his instrument, Paul is, he's speaking to people of light, the people of light. <clears throat> Paul was a master of newness of light, like the newness of life. Like a musician can take, make the instrument, uh, it can make a, uh, a melody, it can make, make harmonies, it can, it can conjure all kinds of, of emotion, and uh, music itself is like a language, and a musician can make the, make the instrument speak. But it takes that it takes that the skill of uh, to interface the the instrument of whatever kind it is. Well, Paul was a master musician when it comes to newness of life, and he knew how to to address newness of life. It's like he's he's strumming the string of newness of life, so that it it uh, it uh, makes melodies and it makes harmonies together. Paul. He's speaking to, to newness of life. Paul, one, could see newness of life, and then he could, um, he could fan the newness of life. He could feed newness of life. He could make, he could help that newness of life. He ministers to that life that God gave. Right. Amen. He's striking a chord. I rejoice in brethren that can, that can see this in, in other, other brethren and minister to that newness of life. Uh, of life, it becomes when when one brother or sister sees newness of life in others. That's the beginning of of um, a giving of gifts to one another. Like Paul said to the Romans, uh, the mutual edification, fellowship together is like it's like giving of gifts uh, to to one another. They'll seek after this gift that you'll be able to strum the the chords of life Amen. in brethren. That's what Paul's doing here. Let us who are of the day. He's bringing out that newness of life. Paul is also identifying the lineage of the children of God. Of the day speaks of a lineage, a heritage, 
of the day, that we're, we're born of light. As children, we have not yet attained to the full knowledge of our, of our heritage. We're, we're in the house, but we haven't seen the whole house yet. <clears throat> Growing in grace and knowledge involves knowing that we are of the day. Yeah. We are children of the day and children of light. John, the apostle, when he wrote, he wanted them, he wanted the brethren to know that they have eternal life. He was, he was like Paul in this way. Paul is one, he's trying to minister uh, to, to the people that he's writing to here in uh, Thessalonica, let us who are of the day. He, he wants people to know not only has God called you, not only has God forgiven you, but you are born of the day. That is of the light of whom God is light. You're of the day. See, he's, he's showing the children what their heritage is. What they're, he's showing them their lineage. Brethren, our lineage is much greater than we have yet seen. We are of, of the day. Paul several times said, I would not have you to be ignorant. And this is one of the, one of the ways in which he, he was ministering so that we wouldn't be ignorant. We, let us who are of the day. Do you remember the day? When you realized you were of the day, there's, I'm, I'm in the light. I'm not in the darkness anymore. That's a blessed day. Moses did, did something like Paul was doing here. Now, on the, uh, when he confronted all the people, they were made the golden calf and they were worshiping the golden calf. And Moses cried that famous, uh, famous uh, word from the Lord, who's on the Lord's side? Moses was drawing a distinction between the people. Some, some people would have, would have turned... Uh, to Moses at that word, who's on the Lord's side, and that, that would have drawn them to Moses. Well, other people that had given themselves to, to this calf, it, that word shamed them. Who's on the Lord's side? Well, it made obvious who wasn't. See, the, so the word was drawing a distinction. It was drawing some people out, and it was, it was drawing a line of demarcation uh, between the, who was on the Lord's side and, and who, who wasn't. <clears throat> Paul also admonished uh, along these lines in uh, the book of uh, uh, Philippians chapter 3. He, Paul gave what we would call a, a, his testimony in Philippians chapter 3. He kind of opened up his heart so that we could see, you know, what, what, made, it, what made it tick. He, that I count this rubbish and I, for the excellency, and he's, he's opening up his heart here. And then he says uh, later in the chapter, he says, As many as therefore as be perfect be thus minded. This... As many as be, be mature, yeah. let us be, be thus minded. Let us think like this about, leaving, about forgetting things that are behind and pressing forward toward things which are before. Let us be thus minded. See how Paul is, he's, he's drawing out a certain, certain kind of people. This word, like if, if you read Philippians 3, if, let, let's say that it was written to the Word of Truth Fellowship. And this word, this chapter 3 was, was read to us. And chapter 3 kind of, it kind of sounded foreign, forgetting things which are behind, and straining forward with that the, the excellency and the and the high calling, and it sounded kind of strange. And then when you get to this, as many as be perfect, let him be thus minded. What what does what does that do to that kind of person who's living on the fringe, who's who's drawn back? It 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 makes it obvious that they've drawn back. See, the, the word of God is like a, is like a sword. It, it divides. There was a couple of times in the Gospels that, that uh, Luke, I believe, he, he mentioned there was a division among the people because of him. They took sides. The Word of God makes people take sides. And this is what... Now, Paul wasn't trying to drive people away. He's actually trying to draw people in. That's, so as many as be perfect, let them be, let them be thus minded. Paul was marking out how mature faith thinks. As many as be perfect. Maturity is, is, is who he's talking about. As many as be perfect. As many as be mature, grown up, uh, of full age. How does that mature faith walk? How does it talk? How does it think? It forgets things that are behind and reaches forward to those things which are, be, are before. That, that's how mature faith walks. Let us be thus minded. So the word of God can, can confirm that you've made progress. You, 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 can, you can find yourself in the scriptures and, and fellowship with uh, in, in, the, in the word of God. And this is, I can see this in myself or the word of God is, 
is um, is a light. Even just even a simple word, and I say I say simple word, knowing that it's not it's not just a single dimension, but a, just a simple word like addressing someone as brother or sister, that can have a profound ministry. Just saying, just calling someone brother if they've drawn back can actually convict them. Or calling someone brother, just addressing them in this kingdom manner can actually, it can be like bringing a wagon of goods like Joseph sent to his father. It can, br it can bring good things of the kingdom. It's, it makes an association. If you are brother, then he is not ashamed to call you brother. Amen. And all things, see, he's able to minister all things. All these things. All, the, the Father's given the kingdom o, over to Jesus. And if you're a brother or a sister in the kingdom, then those things are accessible to you. Amen. You see, so how this identity, this is what Paul's doing. Let us at, who are of the day, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate. Jesus did this when at the great feast day, he, he stood up and he cried, If any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink. If... If any man thirst, he was he was identifying, he was drawing out people who wanted what he had. Jesus still does this. The words of Jesus fall in very different kinds of ears. Some hearing ears, some not hearing ears, some that love him, some that hate him, some that just think of Jesus as kind of a novelty. Herod just wanted to see a miracle. Wasn't really interested in what he had to say, of who he was. His real, his real work that he came to do on the earth, just wanted to see a miracle. It was just kind of, a, kind of entertainment. Just wanted to see something that you couldn't see every day. See, the words of Jesus fall on all different kinds of ears. And to the, it, it, can, it can push people away, and it can draw people in. And that's, see, that's the vein that Paul is writing in here. He says, let us who are of the day. He's drawing, drawing people by the... How we talk to the brethren can be a great help or a great hindrance. When a person assumes that someone is, is basically worldly, basically wayward, that will come out in their words. If I've already concluded that all these, all these people coming to church, they're just, they're just doing it for some selfish motive. They're just doing it to be seen of their neighbors. If, I, if I've already concluded that, it's going to come out in how I talk. Well, Paul here, had, he had concluded that there were people he's writing to that were of the day. Let us who are of the day. <clears throat> that kind of preaching takes on a, a certain kind of flavor. You've probably heard some of this preaching when the preacher's already decided that that the people that, that he's preaching to, they're, 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 uh, they're wayward, and they, they don't love God, and they really do want the world, and they're, and they're selfish. It takes on a, a bitter flavor. Amen. It's not edifying. <clears throat> it, it, it can have a harsh tone to it. Kind of like, it, it actually sounds a lot like uh, those hard words that the old prophets had to, had to deliver to the people that were wayward. I'm not saying that we should that no one should ever deliver a hard word. Paul delivered hard words. Yeah. <clears throat> but if preaching tends to hug the border between flesh and spirit, then um, we we need to. There has to be discernment. There has to be discernment. We we've probably all heard things like this. There always has to be an exception, some some qualifying word or modifying word after the word of God. You've probably heard this, like, we just don't believe it. We just, you know, God is, God is able to make him stand, except we just don't, we just don't believe that. And all grace can abound to you, except, except we just don't take advantage of that. You've heard, people, you've heard people talk like this. That's born out of an assumption that people are not believing. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take this, this approach to the people of God. I'm going to assume that you believe what God said. Now, if you prove me otherwise, that's on your own head. But I'm not going to conclude that you, I don't know the hearts of men. Jesus didn't need any testimony of man. He knew what was in the heart of man. He hasn't told me what was, what's in the heart of every man. I'm going to, if you're in pursuit of God, I'm going to assume that you believe what God said. 
And then that that equips me better to be your help to be a, to be a helper of your faith. That kind that kind of talk of uh, of qualifying the words of, of God and modifying the words of God and putting amendments on the words of God actually stirs up the flesh. It's actually it's, see Paul here in this text, the First Thessalonians, he's aiming at newness of life in people who are of the day. Well, there's other words that actually aim at the flesh and actually stirs stirs up the the flesh. Now, brethren, I'm not saying that we should ignore faults and we should never that we should never rebuke them that sin. That, that's not what I'm saying. Here's what I am saying. We have to speak to those who are without as if they are without and speak to them the peril that they're in. And we have to speak to them that are within as them that are within and affirm to them that God is for them. And we have to speak to them that are not far from the kingdom of God with hope and provoking and, and exhortation because they're, they're not far from the kingdom of God. See, so how we, how we speak to the brethren re requires some discernment. We don't want to give comfort when someone needs rebuked. We don't want to rebuke when someone needs comfort. Amen. That's right. Paul's drawing, he's drawing people uh, to, the, to the Lord when he says, let us who are, who are of the day. Now I want to look into this day. Being of the day, of course, is speaking of the light. The Lord made the distinction in the in the creation between light and darkness. He, uh, the uh, the darkness ruled the the night, and the the light uh, ruled the day. In fact, the first words that we read of of what God said, the first spoken words that God said was, "Let there be light." So this is this is the first thing. This kind of sets the tone. So it, it kind of make you know you start putting things together. I, I like it when there's when the, the threads start connecting through the scriptures. And so you have this first word of God, let there be light. And then you have John says, God is light. And then you have this word from Paul, let us who are of the day. You see the, you see the connections the Lord's making? So of the day means God's brought us to himself. And the, of the day, remember he's speaking of a heritage. He's speaking of a, of a lineage, you're of the day. That means we're, there's, nobody has any light except that it came from God. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And God dwells in the light, which no man can approach unto. So what it, the, the day means you, is, is the time when you can see. Let us who are of the day, of the day means you can see. The sun's shining. It means the, un, the unseen can be known, and the unknown can be seen, because it's day. We're talking about a spiritual day here. The day is at hand. All things, all things are made manifest by the light. And so we, that's why the scripture can say that if we, if we walk in the light, we won't stumble. So saying of the day, he's talking about a, a day of understanding, a day of knowledge, a day of fellowship and a partaking, a partaking with, with God and of the, of the divine nature. It's another way of saying that the day has dawned. We are of the day. The day's dawn on you. That is, God is, like he made sh light to shine in the, in the first day. God commanded the light, and it was light. Well, if you have light in yourself, it's because God commanded the light. He commanded the day in your heart. He shined forth to give the light of the knowledge of himself. So light is like spiritual DNA. He says, of the day. Amen. He's talking about the, the, the kind of life that's in you. What you're, what you are of, is like you're of the, of this family, of this house. There's certain, uh, certain rights and privileges go with that, where you're, what, who you're born of, and where you belong. He's talking about a, a uh, spiritual DNA. We might say that light runs in the family, <laughs> in the family of God. It's a family of light, of knowing, of understanding, of fellowship, and of seeing. We are, we are not. We are not ignorant of his devices, the scripture says. How could we not be ignorant of his devices? Not because we figured them out. It's because the light showed them to us. We are of the day. The day is what blows the enemy's cover. Not smarts. It's not smarts. It's the day. The light has shown us. So we are not ignorant of his devices. See, so in the day, I can neither give place to the devil. How are you, you going to do that? 
How are you going to go about? Neither give place to the devil. That's what we're admonished in Ephesians chapter 4. Don't give place to the devil. What, what are you going to close off? What are you going to shut up? What are you going to avoid? Well, you've got you to have some understanding we're of if you're of the day see you can you can go you can go to work on that if effectively because there's because there's light there's light shining <clears throat> we can discern the opportunities and places that he has that he has made into the human race and we can see he's a, he's seeking whom he may devour i think that word that text that word is used a lot as kind of a um, well it is a warning but it's not only a warning it does come out as a warning. See, he, he's seeking whom he may devour. But what, what does that also mean by implication? That means he can't devour everyone. Right. He's seeking whom he may devour. Amen. Amen. See, there, there's another connection in, in the scriptures. If he's seeking whom he may devour, and if we walk in the light, we won't stumble. Do you see the connection there? That means he can't just come into the light. That's like illegal hunting. <laughs> You know, poaching is not not legal. God doesn't allow poaching either. Amen. Romans 13 says, The night is far spent in the day. The day's at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Let us, let us put on the armor of light. There's a protection in the day. There's things we don't go out and do at night. There's things we can't do at night in the, in the darkness. The light of day is a protection. You know that the Holy Spirit uses this, this phrase, the slight of men, cunning craftiness, and the slight of men. You know, when it's blazing light, the slight of men doesn't work so well. It's not as effective. The wickedness is more active in the dark. But we are of the day. You see the, what a what marvelous provision this is? And it's a lot harder to get, uh, to get caught by ambush when it's light out. Yeah. They ambush in the dark. Yeah. In fact, John said that the men love darkness because their deeds are evil. They don't want them exposed, so they, they love, love the darkness. He says he's made known unto us the mystery of his will. Like, like he promised in Jeremiah, they shall all know me. Well, I suggest, brethren, that we can know the mystery of his will because the light has shined on his will. His light has opened his will to his people. Amen. It's day. We are of the day. The new covenant is an economy of knowledge and fellowship and understanding. That is, it, with, with regards to uh, God working with men, not much can happen where, where people are ignorant and where people are blind and, not, and un, unperceptive. <clears throat> Remember, um, well, Paul prayed, pr prayed for the, the church at Ephesus that they would know the hope of their calling. Yeah. He didn't want them to be ignorant of this. There's ignorance is, a, it is itself a place for the devil. Make no place for the devil? Well, the devil, he thrives in places where people are ignorant. That's right. I'm talking about ignorant of the ways of God. That's right. we're, not, we're not talking about things that you can learn from the world. <clears throat> Ignorance prevails in darkness. I think of the times that Jesus asked his disciples about their, about their not understanding. There was, a, there, was, there was an urgency. There was an urgent tone in Jesus' voice when he said, are you yet without understanding? Oh, yeah. That wasn't a word of comfort. That was a word of provoke, of provoking. Yeah. Yeah. Are you yet without understanding? In other words, this, this, this can't go on and on and on. Are you yet without understanding? I think in, in the, the Lord still provokes us in, in different ways like this. Are you yet without understanding? He's pro prodding us on and leading us on. It's not right to be ignorant when it's day. It's not right to be blind when the light is shining. It's like starving at the table when it's spread abundantly. It's like going hungry when there's plenty to eat. It's not, in fact, it's not sustainable to try and serve God and be ignorant of God. It's not sustainable to try and obey God and be ignorant of God. This, this, makes, a, this makes for a tremendous burden. Amen. To, be, uh, to be, for the, the guilt of obedience and the guilt of service to be laid on people without the knowledge of God being given to them also. 
This, this, is, this can be the kind of burden that nobody can bear, that a person can't bear. They can, they can bow down under it and not bear. How can you serve a God you don't know? How can you sustain how can you sustain a desire to obey a God that you don't understand his ways? You see how this just doesn't, this is not, this is not sustainable. In fact, disobedience, disobedience is itself uh, evidence that a person doesn't know God. That not obeying God and not knowing God are put together in the scriptures. Them that obey not and know not. <clears throat> You see, you see the connection here between being of the day and serving God and understanding, understanding God. So the light of day equips us and empowers us to serve God and to, and to obey God. A person is not going to be able to endure in serving God without knowing, knowing his ways. Just, just imagine how, how difficult would it be if you didn't know that God was a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. How, how strong would your resolve be to seek him if you didn't know that he, he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him? And see, we could, we could make the, that kind of connection and that kind of admonition all through the scriptures and, and put them all together, and here's what we'd have. We'd realize that knowing God is eternal life. Yeah. Amen. And without knowing God, there is, there is no life. All these things are connected to being of the day, of the light. So I can I can run I can run with patience when I can when I can see afar off and I can I can be um, um, as wise as a serpent and innocent as a dove when when it's light when I can see when I'm dwelling in in the light Jesus said the night is when no man can work in fact the dark darkness was a plague in Egypt it was a judgment light is a blessing darkness is a judgment Night is when Jesus was betrayed by Judas. He went out, and it was night. It was nighttime. It was dark. And night is when men stumble. So now here's the words of exhortation. <clears throat> Let us who are of the day be sober. Let us be sober. I like to think of that, uh, that man that Jesus delivered from the legion of demons. The scripture says he was, the people came and saw him after Jesus Delivered him, and he was clothed and in his right mind. Yes. That, that that's something to give thanks for. You can be that, that you're in your right mind. If you if you if you are if you can, if you're loving God today, you're in your right mind. Amen. And if you're seeking after God today, then you're in your right mind. Amen. So herein is a parable. All of us, all of us have been delivered from the devil, yeah. and all of us, Jesus has clothed all of us robes of righteousness and Jesus has given all of us our right mind yeah. now out, outwardly our, uh, our lives didn't look like that that man that had the legion of devils of demons no, nobody would even would even go out there with him he lived among the tombs and he's the one that would break chains and, and cut himself and live is like more, more like, uh, like a wild beast than, it was, yeah. than he was a man I don't think any of us looked like that on the outside, but on the inside, we, we still were taken captive by the devil at his will. And we had to be delivered just the same as that man did. Amen. Our time passed living in the world for ourselves. We were not in our right mind. We were not sober. <clears throat> in your right mind, you can see that living for yourself makes no sense. And living for the Lord makes perfect sense. All things are from him and to him and for him. And no one is going to be able to successfully buck that system. But that's what living for yourself, that's, it's an attempt. Yeah. It's an attempt to make not all things return to God. No, all things are going to return to him. So a, in having your right mind, it simply said, is, is agreeing with God. To have, have a right mind. Amen. Being able to receive from God. That, that's, what, that's what being sober is, is having, having your right mind. I, I'm grateful for, the, for how Brother Bob and Brother Given have, have, uh, have testified about their, the, their weakness of late. <clears throat> as, 
we've been hearing them, the, the words of a, of a right mind. Amen. They've been able to, to speak out of a, out of a right mind. Amen. The scripture also says that we've been given the spirit of power, love, and of a sound mind. That's another way of, of talking about sobriety, of a, of a sound mind. That means that mind's in, in good working condition. <laughs> you've, you've talked to people before, probably. You testified, but you just, you just didn't get it. Oh, the, world, the world's going to pass away, and you're going to die, and you're going to be judged, and it, and it didn't seem to have any impact on them at all. Why? It's not a sound mind. Yeah. That's not a right mind. Yeah. A sound mind is, is one that's in good working condition. <laughs> it's part of the image of God. And sin wrecks it. Sound mind means it's competent and capable. Like Peter says, gird up the loins of your mind. It takes a sound mind. A sound mind can be, it can gird up and do some work. It can plow with the Lord in meditation. <clears throat> the scripture also speaks of having a ready mind. It must have, be, a, be of a ready mind. And those of Thessalonica it says they received the word with all readiness of mind. They received it with readiness of mind. Have you ever uh, heard someone in, after assembly or something say something about the message and, and you missed it? You didn't hear it. Or you listen to a recording afterwards and you think, and I, I know this has happened, and you think, man, I, there was a lot in that message I didn't hear. We need grace, brethren, to have a ready mind. Amen. A distraction is an enemy. Yeah. We've got to have a ready mind. Mm. We're dealing with eternal things here. This is not a hobby. Amen. Dealing with the gospel and with the truth of God, with the, God, with the kingdom, this is, this is matters of eternity. Amen. This is matters, of, it's, it matters that go beyond life and death. That, that seems to be the most grave stakes, you know, that, that men of this world can put out. This is a matter of life and death. Well, our matters, brethren, are much bigger than life and death. Amen. They're, they're matters of heaven and hell. Yeah. They're matters of being accepted and being rejected. Amen. They're matters of reward and they're matters of condemnation. Amen. Now, that, these things call for a ready mind. Amen. Have a readiness of mind. See, David had a ready and a sober mind. When he showed up on that battlefield, where Goliath was calling out those threats and those blaspheming against God, David was the only one in the whole camp that had a ready mind. He heard it one time and made the right conclusion. He had a ready mind, and he went out and, and took him out, and he's probably thinking, why hasn't this already been done? He's defying the armies of God, the armies of the living God. He had a, he had a ready mind, a sober mind, a sound mind, and all the, all the other uh, Israelites were just, they were just dumbfounded by David's boldness and by, by him going out and just take a boy, took out the giant. But David had a ready mind, so it just it looked totally different to him than it did to the rest of them. The three Hebrews uh, children, they had a, well, we say children, young men. They had a ready mind. They didn't have to have a prayer meeting and fast about, do we bow to this image or not? You know, we want to be a good testimony. Maybe we should bow, and then, then we'll have a, then we'll have a good end, you know, with all the Babylonians to testify to them. They had a ready mind. They knew we're not bowing. And when they, they spoke to the king, they said, whether, whether our God saves us or not from your fiery furnace, we're, we're still not bowing. They knew God was able Amen. to, to uh, deliver them, but they also knew that they weren't going to, they weren't going to bow. Peter had a ready mind on the, on the day of Pentecost. They said, these men are drunk. A re Peter had a ready mind. He says, these men are not drunk. This is what Joel was speaking of. God raised up Jesus, and Jesus, he has shed forth this, which you now see in here. That was a ready mind. He had a sound mind. He had a sober mind. He wasn't just going to say, well, you know, it kind of looks like they're drunk, and just kind of let it go. He had a ready mind. Slow of heart to believe is kind of the, it, like the antithesis of a ready mind, of being, of being sober, being it's possible to have a slow heart. It's like Joshua made, made that covenant with the inhabitants of the land that he's supposed to drive out. They were enemies. He made a covenant with them. He was slow of heart. That wasn't, that wasn't a sober dealing. Sober has to do with watching, being alert, and discerning. Unlike Balaam, who had to be admonished by a beast. We want to be sober. 
Lacking sobriety opens the door to many a pain and many a trouble. If we are not sober, we could pass right by an open door that the Lord... Remember the church in Revelation? Before I, I, I set before thee an open door. Without a sober mind, we could pass right by it. <clears throat> if we're not sober, we could be tempted to think that God's in us just because we have some sickness. There are people who have thought that. They think that God's upset with them. That's why they're sick. But I, want, I want to point out some things that that have been said in our midst. Brother Bob said he didn't know that, he, that the Lord had a work for him in Little Rock, Arkansas. Yeah. The Lord took him there in a helicopter. Yeah. And so he, he did some work there that, the, that he was able to do. He was able to see that the Lord opened a door for him. See, that's, that's thinking soberly. Amen. Now, what if, what if Brother Bob had concluded that the Lord was upset with him? Yeah. That the, this was the Lord's anger? It wouldn't have looked like it looks now. Here's something that Brother Givens said about his recent, his recent uh, weakness. He says that the Lord had more insight to give him, but he could, the more insight could go, only come with more weakness. And so Brother Givens said he'd take the weakness gladly. That's a sober mind. Amen. That's sober-mindedness. Brother Justin, he said recently that the infection in his heart is preparing him to be clothed with his house which is from heaven. That's a sober mind. That's a thought of a sober mind. Be sober. See, brethren, <clears throat> without having a sober mind before the Lord, just a, just a little trial will look like a monumental trial. Yeah, that's right. and, and, a, and a tremendous blessing, you may overlook it yeah. without a sober mind. Right. Let us who are of the day be sober, Amen. putting on the breastplate of faith, and love. Sober has to do with being serious and sens sensible, reasonable. Nothing in the scripture is lighthearted. Yeah. There is no levity in the scriptures. <coughs> None at all. There are, there are some words of sarcasm in the scriptures. Divine sarcasm. The Lord said to the people in the, through the, the prophet Isaiah, he says, you, you people cut down a tree and you use part of the wood to cook dinner with, and the other part of the same tree, you carve it out into an image and you bow down to it and say it's your God. That's sarcasm. The Lord's saying he's exposing how, how ignorant this is. That's divine sarcasm, but that's not humor. There's nothing, see, being, being sober is about being serious. In fact, the sarcasm is an effort to break through foolishness. It's like, it's like an effort to shake people awake when the Lord uses this sarcasm. I exhort you, brethren, <clears throat> to be sober like you're in the operating room. Nobody's making jokes in the OR. The patient or the providers. They're not joking around. Be sober. Be sober like you're in a storm at sea. That's not a time to say, hey, let me tell you. <laughs> Everybody's life is in the balance. Be sober. Be sober like you're, like you're only flesh and blood and like you're appointed to die and then face judgment. Be sober like that because you're going to give an account of yourself to God. So be sober and put on the, the breastplate of faith and, and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. I'm going to Go ahead and conclude for the sake of time. <clears throat> I'll deal with that maybe if we live. <laughs> and I'll deal with that in another time in the future. But just, just conclude with this thought about this armor. The faith, hope, and love are a protection. They're a protection for us. As a breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of, the hope of salvation. So I want to, um, always, be, uh, to always be stirred up. Uh, to uh, toward the Lord that when we when we speak to one another we speak unto edification when we speak to one another we pray and when we when we sing uh, to make sure it's for the for the better not not just not just filling the time and and Paul we, we can learn this lesson and observe observe this um, this determination from the Apostle Paul he always left people better whether he was with them whether he wrote to them Whatever, whatever contact that he had with the people of God, he always added something to them. 
And I, I pray that, um, that I've added something to you tonight, and I exhort you to be sober of the day, and um, the, the end is near, where the Lord will, will come with a shout, and we will be gathered to him, brother. Amen. Amen.